Welcome to K is for keeping municipalities safe on the political trenches, local government at work. Today, we are honored to have Ontario MPP Stephen Blay. Stephen is currently serving as the member of provincial parliament for the riding of Orleans, a role he has been in since a by-election in 2020. Prior to being elected to provincial office, Stephen served as councillor for Cumberland Ward in the city of Ottawa. Today, we want to dive into Bill 5, or Stopping Harassment and abuse by local leaders act we will discuss how this bill will work his thoughts on how municipalities across ontario are passing motions to support the members bill Stephen, welcome to the show thank you and thank you uh for having me so i want to start with the the, the million dollar question here where did bill five come from because it, you must have seen a need that this was not being addressed so you presented this bill how did it come about? Yeah, so um, it really stemmed from my time uh, on Ottawa City Council. So in my last term on council, um, right around, I guess, over the winter of 18 into 19, uh, there were some uh, rumors floating around the city that um, one of our colleagues was under investigation. We didn't really know who or what. And it was just kind of gossip and rumors. And those uh, kind of persisted throughout much of uh, much of uh, 2019, and uh, eventually it was revealed that uh, uh, some pretty significant allegations were made against uh, one of my colleagues at the time, Councillor Rick Shirelli, who had been elected to Ottawa City Council for you know 30 years, I think, uh, at that point, uh, going back to the pre-amalgamation days, and. Um, uh, Slowly over the course of um, 2019, uh, the media got a hold of, uh, of stories. Um, and as it turns out, and has been demonstrated through a series of integrity commissioner investigations, and in fact, uh, a court ruling basically upholding the, the facts of the matter, uh, Mr. Shirelli had been uh, psychologically, emotionally, um, harassing and, and tormenting his staff, uh, many staff members, female staff members, over, over the course of um, years and years. And um, uh, as that was kind of developing, as the first stories were appearing in the newspaper, and as we had uh, requested or been informed that the integrity commissioner um, was, uh, was looking into these matters, this is when the by-election in Orleans happened, and and I got elected to to provincial parliament in uh, in February of of twenty twenty. So skip ahead to the fall of that year, uh, the integrity commissioner had done some investigations, and the city of Ottawa had uh, council had uh, received the report and um, accepted the conclusions of the report and uh, begun the uh, the consequence part of uh, of the process. And in Ontario, under the Municipal Act, um, consequences for this kind of behavior for, for councillors and for mayors um, are quite limited. Uh, you know, they can be barred from access, accessing city facilities and buildings, um, and they can be docked pay. Uh, I believe it's uh, 90 days uh, is the maximum that they can be docked pay. And so... Because there had been a, a number of violations, or the integrity commissioner had ruled that there had been a number of violations, the city uh, took a pretty liberal, I think, interpretation of the law and, and docked the 90 days pay for each of the individual uh, um, situations. And so resulted in, in, in Rick losing pay for about a year, something like that, just under a year. Um, and... Uh, they had all expressed a point of view, the council and, and the mayor, um, Jim Watson at the time, that they didn't feel that the docking of pay was really um, a satisfactory consequence given the nature of, uh, of what he had done. And they began to engage uh, the province, uh, Minister Clark, uh, to have the, uh, the integrity rules for, for municipal uh, politicians change so that one of the consequences could be, uh, you know, losing your seat, vacating, vacating office. And this was, as I said, towards the back end of, of 2020. Uh, as it happens, I believe November is, um, uh, um, there's a month in November, I believe it's relating to stopping the abuse of women. I don't remember the formal name of it now. 
but I gave uh, I gave him a, a statement in the House at that time, basically calling on the government to to take up this uh, take up this uh, this concern this challenge uh, because in the interim, I had learned that in addition to the the situation in Ottawa, which was uh, pretty severe, and if you hear the specifics of the allegations, pretty um, pretty atrocious, that there was. Uh, you know, I was arguing equally uh, serious and atrocious situation in Brampton that had been ongoing for a long time. There was one that we were just starting to, to hear about uh, developing in Barrie. And then as it turns out, over the course of the next number of months, um, uh, lots of other stories came forward, including um, one in, in Mississauga, where a councillor was actually harassing another councillor and ultimately to the point where um, she chose to resign her office because she just uh, it wasn't worth dealing with right the the trauma of it all and so when the government responded to the city uh, and to, to and to me because I had written to the minister asking for the same thing they basically said no thanks we're not going to get into it um, you know thanks very much um, I started working on uh, the first version of the bill and and ultimately introduced it in. Um, the, for the first time, I guess in the spring of, uh, I, I guess the spring of twenty one, and it's and it's kind of been on a path uh, ever since. I think this is now the third iteration of the bill, because it's it's died once because of prorogation, and then uh, we got it uh, passed second reading, uh, and then it died with the election last spring, and uh, and now we're on to the try number three. I'll jump in if I can. Presumably, when you were uh, working on this and other people perhaps doing some research for you, you might have seen uh, bills or law in uh, acts in other provinces or other codes of conduct, codes of ethics that local governments are looking at uh, or have in place there, too. How did you end up uh, where you did with regards to Bill 5? And did you see anything else you saw as particularly innovative in other provinces or things that were pretty consistent with other provinces or territories as well? Yeah, I think the challenge when you're talking about um, consequences for elected officials is that, you know, uh, we live in a democratic society, obviously, and the will of voters is ultimately the, uh, you know, the kind of the ultimate deciding force and factor. And so I think broadly speaking, there's um, hesitation to kind of go down the route of this kind of consequence for elected officials for most for most things. Mm -hmm. I think there's obviously an evolution in society as well where you know this kind of behavior while never appropriate was tolerated or not talked about for you know decades and decades and decades and as a result became kind of almost habitual just kind of part of the game type of practice unfortunately for women who, who work in politics and in, and in government and probably many other professions and so um there wasn't a lot that we could see that pre-existed other than uh, uh, laws around election finance violations and a conflict of a conflict of interest violations, so at least in Ontario, if you're in a conflict of in interest and you're found to have acted in the conflict and it's um, you know serious enough, you can you can be forced to vacate your office for that. Right. Uh, if there's an election spending violation, you're you're forced to uh, to vacate office for that. And in Ontario, to go one step further, we have two we have two election finance rules in Ontario for for municipal candidates. There's the spending limit during the what you would call the the writ period, I guess, for lack of a better term, that the money you spend to actually help you get elected. And then there's a second spending limit that only applies to your victory party or your post election day celebrations. And if you go over that second spending limit which is basically for beer and food for your volunteers on election night. If you go over that limit by, by one cent, there is no process. The automatic consequence is vacating of office. Like there's no wiggle room at all there. And so when you think about that, buying a beer for a volunteer who knocked on doors for four months after the election is over can get you kicked out of office. But asking your uh, assistant go to, to go to a strip club to spy on your political enemies uh, will get you, you know, the equivalent of a slap on the wrist. It, it didn't really make a lot of sense, and so we we formulated Bill Five really around the both the process and then the ultimate consequence around conflict of interest uh, provisions. Really, I've seen a lot of reticence across the country of one order of government removing members of another order of government for a variety of different reasons. That seems sure. to be something you've taken into effect here. With it doesn't, from what I've read anyway, it's not the elected folk 
who would remove a person. It would be the courts uh, who would have that power. Is that right? Yeah. And so the way we've designed it, as I mentioned, we've modeled it very closely on the conflict of interest uh, uh, rules that exist in Ontario already. There's an accusation. Uh, the integrity commissioner in the city or, or the municipality would would investigate and make a determination as to the you know the validity of the accusation, but also the serious of, seriousness of the accusation. There would not be any kind of automatic penalty. Um, you know there are circumstances which uh, a, a financial fine or ordering of classes or something like that might be quite appropriate. Um, uh, but if the integrity commissioner found that the uh, the, the the situation was serious enough that you should lose your job, then uh, council would then request that basically um, the file be sent uh, for judicial review. And ultimately a judge would hear um, the evidence from the integrity commissioner and presumably from, from the, the counselor who's being accused and make an ultimate de determination about whether the office should be vacated or not. Thanks. And we also put a provision in there that this process could not begin uh, during the uh, during the election cycle, so that you would take kind of the threat of political abuse and electoral, you know, using it as an election kind of weapon out of the uh, out of the toolbox, so to say, uh, to keep the integrity of the process, um, uh, you know, as irrefutable as as we could make it. Thanks. I, I, this this bill seems like a slam dunk. It seems like something that needs to happen. But you were on your third iteration of this. You talked about how it was presented in 2021. You prorogued, presented in 2022. Election happened. You're presenting it for a third time. What's stalling this process? Because it seems like this would be a no-brainer for any government to say, okay, we need better rules and regulations when it comes to our local elected officials. And I know I'm asking the political question here, Stephen, I do apologize, but I feel like as an elected official, you're ready for the political question. So what's holding this bill up? Yeah, well, politics. Um, <laughs> so um, as I was preparing to introduce the bill for the first time, I uh, uh, Shortly before I had intended to introduce it, uh, I started to begin to speak to some stakeholders to try to establish some, you know, third party validation and 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 things like that. And basically, a couple of days after that process begun, the government held a shotgun uh, late afternoon on a Friday news conference to announce that they were going to conduct um, consultations about this very issue uh, across the province. And so then I introduced my my bill basically the next business day after that. Um, and so the government has done consultations across this with municipalities in Ontario. Uh, they they did that over the course of I don't know six six to nine months something like that. Both the the minister of municipal affairs and at the time the uh, the minister responsible for women's issues. And um, it's important to note that the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, which is uh, you know, all 400 and, and some odd municipalities in Ontario getting together uh, to, to help advocate for municipal issues to the, to the government, they have broadly endorsed um, the ideas that are encapsulated in my bill. They, they haven't come out and said, you know, Blaze bill is what you should do, but basically that there needs to be a review of the process, there needs to be a consequence for this kind of thing, and the consequence needs to include, you know, the, the ability to be removed from office, basically. And so... They kind of um, dragged their feet on it the first time because they were doing a they were doing a, their own process and they were going to have their own bill. And in fairness, for me, I thought that was perfectly fine. If the government wants to bring a bill tomorrow, uh, we've told them we'll support it. Uh, that's no problem, and we'll do whatever we can to to have that done quickly. And in fact, in the um, sort of time is blended together, so let me just get my dates right. But in the in the in the fall before the the election last year, so I guess this would have been the fall of twenty one. Uh, Minister Clark's office briefed me and briefed the NDP critic on their version of the bill, and they were getting ready to introduce their own version of the bill. And uh, both uh, our caucus and the NDP caucus committed in writing to do everything that we could to pass the bill quickly, uh, both through the, the the ledge and through committee. So that it could be uh, receive royal assent and give the ministry and the minister enough time to implement uh, changes and and you know pass whatever regulations might need to follow 
before the municipal election cycle uh, started in 2022. And that, that starts in May in, in Ontario. And so we had committed to that. As it turns out, they never introduced their own bill. Um, and so we voted on it. We debated mine and, and voted on mine in, in March, uh, which still gave the government, you know, six or seven weeks to send it to committee and, and bring it back. In Ontario, they have passed major pieces of legislation in about 14 days when they really want to, even shorter than that. And so there was lots of time to do that. They chose not to send it to committee. Uh, when they were asked in question period why they weren't sending it to committee, they said I was grandstanding for the election, even though this process had been underway for, you know, the better part of a year and a half at that point. And then, you know, the election happens and it uh, everything comes off the table. And so I reintroduced it as uh, basically the first sitting day uh, back uh, uh, after the after the spring election. And um, in Ontario, the way that private members business works is everyone's name goes in a hat, your name gets pulled out of a hat, and that's the order you get to debate your your private members bills in. And so mine happens to be a, bit, a little bit later on the list. So we're going to we're going to get an opportunity to, to debate it um, at the end of May. And um, I've been consistent the entire time. If if the government has their bill, and I know they have a version of the bill because I've seen it, if they want to introduce it, the offer is still on the table that we will, uh, you know, if it's clean and not, you know, attached to all sorts of other, you know, things that they might want to try to accomplish that we would disagree with, that uh, we will will pass it up and down as as fast as we can, and they can they can be begin implementing it. But to date, they haven't uh, taken us up on that offer. You, you talked about how the provincial government in Ontario had to do some engagement for their bill. When you were writing Bill 5, did you do engagement with municipalities as well, as well as what Ian talked about engaging with potentially looking at other minis uh, provincial jurisdictions for their bills? And then on the flip side of that question, because I'm going to ask a double question here, then I'm going to let Ian jump in. Municipalities across Ontario are endorsing the need for a bill like Bill 5. They're not coming out and saying we need exactly Bill 5, but they're saying, like you said, with uh, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, we need this in, uh, enacted. Does this give you some hope that the Ford government and the provincial government will actually take this serious, that more municipalities are signing on and saying we need something like this? Yeah, so on, on the consultation piece, I uh, definitely spoke to... Um, uh, a number of people within municipalities, elected officials, uh, people that work in um, the clerk's departments in, in a number of municipalities, some uh, municipal uh, solicitors, um, the, the clerks and uh, have their own uh, clerks and treasurers have their own trade association, AMCTO, and spoke to some some people there, and so, and as I said, broadly use the kind of conflict of interest. Uh, process as kind of a guiding light to to the the drafting of the of the bill, and understood that I would have, you know, a fair amount of support, uh, certainly in the cities where uh, they had dealt with these kinds of issues, you know, very recently, Ottawa, Brampton, uh, Barrie, uh, etc. Um, Sorry to interrupt. So Sorry to interrupt, Stephen. But is it still an issue? Is abuse by a local elected leader still an issue in Ontario? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. It's just yeah. because you don't continue on with something unless you still see that there is a need for it. So do you still see a need for this? Because maybe the integrity commissioners, because I know there are more integrity commissioners in Ontario that are being appointed now. Do we need this still? hundred percent. Like, I think it's, if in the kind of year, year and a half that I started talking about this, and by just scratching the surface, we kicked up, you know, three, four, five, what I would call like banner headline serious problems. There are going to be um, a much larger number of maybe smaller scale problems, right? Um, and ultimately, I think it's important that your elected representatives reflect kind of social norms uh, of the day. Um, I don't know where the two of you work in, in your day jobs, but I would suggest that if you did this kind of thing to women that you work with or clients or just someone walking out of the front door of your office looking for anything, you'd probably lose your jobs pretty quickly. Most most people in most jobs in Ontario would for the kinds of things that happened in Ottawa and in Brampton and, and in Mississauga. 
<laughs> and um, there wouldn't be a lot of outcry about it because um, I think we've come to a place where uh, demeaning uh, your coworkers, uh, you know, sexually exploiting uh, your your coworkers or, or or not even coworkers, people who are working for you and you have that you know position of authority over, it, it's clearly wrong. And and uh, as more and more of those stories, not just in politics but in all aspects of life have come to the forefront, you know, I think there's broad acceptance that uh, this needs to stop. And one of the ways you um, get it to stop over time is ensuring that, um, you know, there's a clear consequence that you're going to lose your job. You know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, if a scandal like what happened in Ottawa uh, became public, there was like an honor amongst thieves kind of thing, right? Like the politician would just resign because they didn't want to go through it. They didn't want to put their family through it. They had the honor to kind of just step back and, and walk away because of any number of changes in society, changes in how the news works, um, changes in communication vehicles that we all have access to. That doesn't happen anymore, or it's pretty rare, right? John Tory is the rare exception kind of in the modern, in the modern um, kind of context, because most people think that they can they can get through it and and still have some degree of success afterwards. Um, but I think it's pretty hard to to look anyone in the eye and say that if you do these kinds of things, not only are you going to keep your job, and continue to get paid, continue to build pensionable service on the backs of uh, backs of taxpayers. Um, you know, it, if you ignore it long enough, it'll go away, and you'll just be able to go about your business and continue to have you know position of um, authority and respect and prominence, you know, within your community. I think that's, uh, I think that's beyond the pale. And when I talk to people in Ottawa, they can't believe that this thing is still going on. Like there's been so much, you know, Ottawa, because of how serious the situation was here, you know, it got a fair bit of media attention, both the situation, both, and, and my, my attempts to try to uh, create this process, people can't understand how this hasn't been dealt with yet, that it's just not like, it's such a no-brainer no kind of, as you said, Chris, that they're confused as to how this is still uh, not just the the law of the land. And I think your second question was, you know, is the the effort to get municipalities to kind of sign on to the idea? Uh, yeah, we definitely hope that it, it helps. Look, Amo wrote a letter to the premier uh, expressing the need for these, uh, for this, Kind of review of the integrity measures and for this consequence to, to be legislated uh, about six weeks ago, I think. Uh, Roma, which is the Rural Municipal Association, wrote to the minister uh, last week or the week before. Uh, I've lost count of how many cities and, and municipalities have passed resolutions. We're, I think, above 50 now, it, not, not just including Ottawa, but Mississauga, uh, Barrie, um, uh, a number e of even uh, small uh, towns. Even oh, small towns are signing, signing on. Because I, I made up a list. Town of Georgina, Perry, city of Perry Sound, uh, the sorry, the town of Perry, the municipality of Aaron Eldersale. Like small, medium, large municipalities are signing on. It's it's it, it exactly. It's and um I hope that they're not signing on because they've got a situation. Uh, I hope that they're signing on because they see the the value in it and they want to try to um, prevent something from happening. And, you know, the more we talk about it, the more uh, the more groups are signing on. And we're very fortunate that there have been some uh, members of the community that have um, been drawn to the issue and, and kind of taken hold of it and really led a, a, a grassroots effort to, to go to some of these smaller communities and, and get council resolutions. Uh, you know, the women of Ontario uh, say no, um, have been instrumental in, in that effort. I don't want to take any I don't want to take any credit for that. They they've done the legwork on on virtually all of that and um you know part of it this is a good example um the 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 women of ontario organized have organized um people across the province you know to call their mpp to try to sit down with their mpp or their city councilor, etc to advocate for this uh, one of my colleagues uh in the legislature came up to me the other day because this had happened to her and she wanted to know more about the bill. She didn't understand, uh, you know, kind of going back to the democracy is sacrosanct. Why isn't that enough? Kind of point of view. The kinds of situations that would would uh, lead to this being necessary. Describe what happened in Ottawa. She agreed that was pretty extreme. 
described uh, some of the other situations, agreed with all that. I talked about the judicial process, the the uh, the, the prohibition during the election cycle, um, and the fact that this is not some kind of automatic uh, consequence. There are there could be circumstances where you know harassment happens where the consequence shouldn't be losing your job. Like there is a there is a spectrum. I think and everyone can acknowledge that there's a spectrum acti of activity here that should determine consequences. And I think most reasonable most reasonable people would would agree with that. Um, and I, I still come back to, and, and I think people probably get tired of me saying it. I know some of the journalists do, but if you're working at Walmart, you're going to get fired for some of this stuff. Or if you're working at a school and you're going to get fired for the, some of this stuff, then why shouldn't we be able to get fired for this? It's just, we need to be, we need to have the, the, um, the kind of moral authority to be representatives of our community. And how can you really maintain that authority um, if you've been acting this way, um, you know, under the cover of darkness, so to speak, um, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Can I jump in and I, you, you, you commented on the democracy, the sacrosanct nature of democracy, the will of the people being expressed, that sort of thing. Yeah. And I'm sure it's a move not taken lightly. And I noticed that to remove an elected official, the language that you use in your bill is permissive rather than prescriptive. So it's you're suggested that there can be other consequences too. The nuclear option, if you like, of removing an elected official is one thing, but then the the, the, the ability of that elected official to uh, run again in the next election is something that has been removed as well. You've suggested, I think, that it ought to be two more elections, uh, that the, the person needs to sit on the sidelines and think a little bit about what they have done, yeah. which, of course, prevents the will of the, the people potentially from being expressed. Now, in some places, Alberta, for example, uh, the person who is disqualified from office can run in the next election. In Saskatchewan, they can't run for 12 years or essentially three elections. You've, you've landed on eight years, two plus election cycles, I guess, depending on when the person would be removed from office. How did you end up uh, with the concept of disallowing a person from standing for office in, in the next election or two more for that matter too? Uh, because that is the same consequence that exists for election finance uh, violations. So at the end, at the end of the uh, municipal election, when you submit your, um, you know, financial disclosures and your audited statements, if you don't submit those, um, you're disqualified for 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 the two preceding uh, the two preceding elections. And so I basically just duplicated that uh, that uh, that process. I knew that the hardest part of doing this would be the, you know, the sacrosanct nature of democracy, right? And so I was really intent on trying to find um, and duplicate the processes and consequences that already exists within our democratic environment for other uh, violations. Uh, I think election finance violations are obviously... Uh, very important. I don't think how much money you spend on beer at your victory party should really uh, force you to out of office, but you know that's another story altogether. But we have already agreed in Ontario that there should be certain processes for certain kinds of uh, offenses, most of them around money. Yeah, uh, that would lead you to, to to losing your office. I'm not sure, you know, and that's the whole point of the bill. Why that same process shouldn't exist if you're, you know. Uh, abusing, harassing, uh, you know, coercing your staff or your colleagues and, and others, uh, you know, emotionally, sexually, physically, uh, et cetera. I do actually have one quick one. My last question probably for you is you call this stopping harassment and abuse by local leaders rather than of local leaders. So the yeah. as for the perpetrator rather than the receiver, I presume that was done consciously. And if so, can you, can you talk briefly about why you chose to name it that? Yeah, so in fact, the first iteration of the bill, as we were going through research and drafting, we had also included school trustees uh, in the first iteration of, of the draft. And so we didn't think that, uh, you know, councillors, mayors, municipal officials, whatever verbiage you might use, uh, really captured the totality of it, which is why we came to, to local leaders. Um, and... Uh, Ultimately, it's targeted at those local leaders that are uh, 
you know, committing these, these acts. And so that's really how we, that's really how we came up with it. Um, there was also some effort to try to get the words to line up to a, an acronym. Uh, it didn't work <laughs> out exactly the way we wanted, but there was some effort there as well. And, Thanks. I have a double word at question, d double question, but I'm going to try and make it one here. First, we have municipal leaders who listen to this show from across Canada and particularly in Ontario. What would you want them to know about this bill that we haven't talked about yet? And two, to play the devil's advocate with you here for a second, while you're focusing on local elected leaders, there will be some local elected leaders, uh, municipally elected or uh, school board elected, who will say, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Does Ontario currently have rules in place that if this happens provincially, there would be ways to stop harassment by local, uh, provincially elected leaders? So on, on the second one, there is in, in the kind of research and drafting process of the first iteration, uh, spoke at length with the, the, uh, the clerk of the legislature. Uh, there is a provision where the legislature can vote to remove members. Um, it's, I, I, I believe, and I'm not by no means a historian, I believe it was used once in the 19th century uh, I think it had something to do with mental capacity um, failing uh, of the member, but that provision exists. Um, and I can tell you there was some discussion as to whether it should happen with some of the members who were perhaps taking more extreme uh, stances vis-a-vis -vis COVID uh, the last uh, couple of years as well. It obviously never got to that point, but there was at least some kind of behind the scenes discussion of it uh, that happened. So there is a... There is a, a process that could happen in the legislature to 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 remove someone uh, from office. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your first question. The first was question there. was, what else would you want people to know about? Because you you talked yeah. about how you're hoping to have this uh, in the legislature in uh, the end of May when you're going to be debating this. What else would you want to know of people to know about in the run up till then? Sure. So. You know, we've taken great care to put measures in so that um, this can't be used as a political weapon. You know, we're, I was very highly sensitive to a lot of concerns from, from councillors uh, and municipal officials across the province that, you know, even predating this issue, that uh, the integrity commissioner function had started to be, be abused by, by colleagues. You know, they were launching launching investigations over relatively what I think many people would consider to be relatively small, innocuous kind of workplace disagreements. Um, and, you know, when that gets into the news and becomes a thing, you know, the the punishment might, or the consequence of that investigation, whether you're deemed to have violated any code of conduct or not, can, you know, kind of outstrip the, the, what happened, right? Uh, because there, some of these things were being launched over, I think, what many would call small kind of spats that you might have with a colleague any, you know, in any workplace. And so we took great care to ensure that one, there would not be some kind of automatic penalty. Two, this would not be a decision of elected officials to be used as some kind of political weapon to remove someone who disagrees with the mayor or doesn't fall in line or, you know, whatever you want to uh, put around that. And, uh, and ultimately it would be a decision by a judge after having heard uh, the evidence from the investigation and, and presumably the evidence of the defense. This is not, you know, no one has, this is not a, a situation where it has to rise to criminal, uh, criminal activity or criminal level of, 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 uh, of activity. Um, and I think that mirrors what we see in workplaces to most workplaces today. You don't have to commit a crime against one of your coworkers or one, one of your subordinates to lose your job. There are standards of workplace ethics, morals, um, that we all, or almost all of us, you guys probably do, apparently I don't, but everyone is supposed to be required to, to follow uh, as part of the, you know, privilege of holding your job. 
Um, and I think over time, probably because of the nature of democracy, some elected officials have lost the sense that it is a privilege that, you know, we don't have some kind of sacrosanct right to do whatever we want for four years because uh, people put a, a check mark beside our name, right? Like, you know, it is a privilege to hold these positions. Uh, not only are you making decisions that affect people's daily lives, affect their pocketbook, affect, you know, and municipally, municipally, you can make decisions that affect almost every aspect of how you live your life from the morning you wake up to the morning you go to bed. Um, the people making those decisions should be of, uh, you know, high moral standard and character and should be able to honestly go up into any form anywhere and say, I represent these people and that those people are, uh, even if they disagree with you and even if they voted against you, acknowledge that, you know, you have the respect to, to represent them properly. And I just don't know how you do that when, um, you know, some of the case, you know, in some of the circumstances we've, we've seen, right. I can tell you that in Ottawa, Mr. Shirelli was politically impotent for the entirety of the time after this came out, you know, even once the consequences of, of his pay stopping ran out, he couldn't come to council. He came once every three months to avoid the, the automatic uh, removal provision that exists for, for missing too many meetings. I think he probably benefited from the fact that the meetings went virtual. So he could, he could zoom into the meetings uh, because it happened during, during COVID. Um, and because of what happened, there was no, uh, he had no political capital left. Any political capital he might've had going in was sucked down the drain um, instantly. And so I'm sure his office could continue to, to provide day-to-day -day support to constituents. And I'm, I'm, I presume that they, I presume that they did, but there was no major file that Rick could have influence over. There was not, you know, he was just another guy at the meeting and that's not really fair to the, 55 or 60,000 people that he represented um, because they, they effectively had an empty shell there uh, for, for three years. Let's unmute myself here for a second. Stephen, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to sit down with you and talk about Bill 5 and how it will impact and change the landscape of municipal local elected leaders when it comes to harassment. So thank you so much for A, advocating for this uh, need, but B, for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this with us. So greatly appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your interest and uh, congratulations on the show. Uh, look forward to, uh, well, maybe not listening to myself on your show, but <laughs> listening to the episodes that come after. Awesome. Thank you, Appreciate it.